Before we get started, I'd like to recognize some special guests we have with us this evening, and I'll begin with our Simi Valley Mayor Pro Tem, Barbara Williamson. Barbara? Our Simi Valley City Manager, the inestimable Mike Sedell. Uh, Thousand Oaks City Council members Tom Glancy and Dennis Gillette. <laughs> Janice Gallagly, the wife of our great Congressman Elton Gallagly. Janice. <laughs> and of course, the ever present Duke Blackwood, the director of the Reagan Library. Duke. <laughs> okay, when I was a kid, Starting at the age of 10, I was a paper boy for a newspaper called The Evening Star. By the time I graduated from college, it had sadly gone out of business and was bought by the Washington Post. I'd always regretted its demise because it was by reading that paper every day that I, before I set out on my route, that I grew interested in politics and the news. Now, I know you're wondering what in the world does some kid's paper route have to do with introducing our special guest, Katie Couric, who is one of the most dynamic and experienced television news personalities of our age? It turns out for me, a lot, but let me explain. My route took me to the reaches of a few wonderful neighborhoods, some that are right out of a Norman Rockwell painting. From Forest Lane down Chesterbrook Road, and down to 40th Street, my route took a right-hand turn and circled back towards my home about 100 newspapers from there. Now, I want to stress that it took a right on 40th because had it turned left instead, which I really wish it did, I might have gotten to meet Katie Couric a lot sooner than today. <laughs> it turns out we grew up, I mean, right to down the street and at the same, same age from each other in Arlington, Virginia. And while we went to different schools, I am here to bear witness that Katie Couric was the best thing to ever come out of our neighborhood. <laughs> now, when I worked on Capitol Hill during the Reagan years, I watched Katie from afar just about every day when she was working at one of her first television jobs at WRC-TV Channel 4, the local NBC affiliate in Washington, D.C. I remember thinking at the time, wow, has she ever made it? And she's like, really cute. <laughs> then I thought, well, you know, what are the odds I could finally meet her and maybe it was slim. Before you could blink an eye, she was reporting nationally for NBC News as their deputy Pentagon correspondent and serving as a substitute host on the Today Show. From there, it was another blink and she found herself as the permanent co-host of the Today Show, where she had an astonishingly successful and fun-filled 15-year run. There, she became America's sweetheart. You might have heard of that show, the most dominant morning news and talk show on television for the last 16 years. Katie made it that way. I had breakfast with her, so to speak, every morning for years, as I'm sure many people <laughs> in the audience did as well. And from there, Katie went on to break a glass ceiling, a big one, and do what no other woman in the history of television journalism had by becoming the news anchor and managing editor of CBS Evening News for the last five years. The next chapter in Katie's life should prove to be an exciting one now that she's joined ABC and prepares to launch Katie a new daytime talk show that will reach well over 60% of the American voting audience when it debuts next September. So she's here today to say hello to Mrs. Reagan, uh, who she has interviewed several times, to talk about her book, her life, and maybe even how she's managed to avoid a paperboy all these years. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a conversation with Katie Kirk. Funny. When John told me he had a funny thing to say in 
uh, the introduction tonight, I said, oh my God, did we used to date? <laughs> <laughs> Apparently we didn't, but almost, John. So it's nice to see you. My paper boy's name was Ralphie Janoska, believe it or not. And I still remember him. And I had a little crush on him, by the okay. way. So before we start, I just want to thank everyone so much for coming. And I'm so thrilled to be here. Um, Mrs. Reagan has always been one of my favorite people in the world. I've had the pleasure, as John said, of interviewing her on numerous occasions, and uh, I am so fond of her and feel we share a special friendship and have through the years. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here for her and to pay tribute to her wonderful husband, President Reagan, as well. And, and I just wanted to say that because I, I think so highly of her, and I can't wait to gossip with her after we're done here. <laughs> <laughs> Terrific. Uh, Katie. First, I just want you to know before I ask you a question, you know, I'm sure that when you come through the door to interview someone, the person on the other end is like really nervous. I, I want <laughs> you to always. just think about it's like for me to be interviewing you. Okay. <laughs> um, first, your book. Um, most famous people, celebrities, when they write a book, it's all about me, 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 you know, but you didn't do that. You know, you wrote a book about others and advice from others. What made you decide to make that your book? Well, the reason this book came about is I often give graduation addresses, which I take very seriously. Um, I think it's a real privilege to be able to talk to young people going out in the world, and I work exceedingly hard on them, and I've done many at this point. Um, I did Williams College. I gave the class day address at Princeton. Um, I have spoken at the University of Oklahoma. Senator Boren asked me to do that. And so um, a couple of years ago, I was speaking at Case Western Reserve. And to be honest with you, I kind of was tired of telling my story to the graduates. And I thought, gee, I have had such an incredible career, and I've met so many accomplished, interesting people. Why don't I reach out to a few of them who I am friendly with? I never profess to be friends or BFF with, BFFs with these folks, but I thought, why don't I reach out to them and see if they might be able to say something instructive that they've learned in their life for the college graduates at Case Western Reserve. So I reached out to Queen Rania, for example, who I'd gotten to know through the years, and Cheryl Crow, who performed a lot on the Today Show, who I got to know as well, Biz Stone, who started Twitter and, of course, gave his response in 140 characters. And, uh, and I started getting some really nice uh, responses from people. And I only reached out to about a dozen folks. And I incorporated them in my address at Case Western Reserve. And suddenly I thought, wow, this is a great idea for a collection of essays because I think everyone, no matter where they are in life and no matter what they've accomplished, if they're movie stars or singing stars or you know, politicians, many of them have gone through very similar experiences that, that all of us have gone through and could be very inspiring. So I cast quite a wide net and I ended up um, getting 116 people to contribute to this book. And so I put it together, and, and it, I really did it as a gift. I, I'm not making any money on it. I, it all, my proceeds all go to an organization called Scholarship America. There's some Scholarship <laughs> America people. <laughs> They are a very, very enthusiastic bunch. They're great. And I did a lot of research, and I wanted it to be a merit-based scholarship and, and open to everyone. You know, there's, there are wonderful scholarship organizations like the United Negro College Fund and those that focus on minorities, but I really wanted it to be need-based, not merit-based, but need-based and open to everyone. And Scholarship America was started in 1958 by a man named Irv Ratkin, an optometrist in Fall River, Massachusetts, who asked everyone in his community to give a dollar so the kids could all go to college in their town. And from there, it's grown to a huge fund, that, but it doesn't get that much attention. We're trying to change that. And they've raised, I think, $2.4 billion and sent 1.7 million kids in this country to college who otherwise couldn't afford it. So it's my little gift to Scholarship America, and hopefully it will help inspire some people. And it's not really just for college graduates. I always say it's for people who maybe want to take stock of their lives and recalibrate. I just got a wonderful 
letter um, email from the Junior League of New York because this organization called, what organization? The Bayview Correctional Facility with a lot of the inmates, the female inmates were actually using this book to discuss their lives and their mistakes and their future and their dreams. And many of them wrote me how inspired they were by some of the contributions that are made in this book. And I also tried to tell a little of my life story and divided it up in certain, you know, different chapters about the importance of persistence or the importance of giving back. So it's something I'm really proud of. And I hope, you know, all the nice people who bought it today, I hope you enjoy it. And I hope others who haven't will. <laughs> so Very good. that's a shameless plug. <laughs> Well, I know the line was long enough for you tonight to sign that book that tonight alone you probably put three kids through college. Katie. I hope so. so. <laughs> I hope so. Um, can we expect a kind of Katie Kirk tells all a memoir in the future? Or uh, you, I think I read something in your book about you, you worry that you might not have the discipline to sit down and actually bang one of those out. You know, I've been approached uh, to, to write a memoir, and I'd like to one day. Um, I really regret that I haven't kept more copious notes or a diary I know when I got my job at the Today Show, Jean Shalit said, you need to buy a tape recorder and just talk into it every day. Of course I didn't, but I, I have a pretty, I mean, I still remember many things. I think I'd like to start, you know, jotting things down and looking back on past interviews. And, you know, I've just had such a, an exciting experience in television news. One day I would like to write a book. But my dad, who passed away in June, was a print reporter before he went into public relations. And he made me promise that if I ever wrote a book, I wouldn't have a co-writer or a ghost writer that I would write it myself. Mm -hmm. So it's quite time consuming. And one day I hope I will, only because I'd like to share some of the, some of the things I've done and experiences I've had. Yeah, I, I know everybody here would love to read such a book. So I hope so. Yeah, who knows? Yeah. I always thought the name could be uh, oh, no, no, yeah, don't call me Perky. Or, <laughs> and I always thought on my gravestone I would put Perky no more. <laughs> um, you, you, I think 115 contributions to the book, as you said. Are there one or two that stand out to you? You go, wow, that one really impressed you. You know, it's such an a incredible collection. John was nice enough to let me to have a book in my lap because there's so many great uh, people who wrote essays that it, it's hard to remember. I know Morgan Freeman wrote about being on St. Lucia and his sailboat yeah, broke down yeah, and yeah. he couldn't find any parts for it. And he kept looking and looking. He finally came to a junkyard and he asked the fellow, he was exhausted. It was the end of the day. He didn't think he'd ever get his boat fixed and he needed some very specific part and of course, the guy said, yeah, I actually have it. And it, you know, that sort of illustrated the, the fact that he said, you just can never give up. Dogged determination pays off. I mean, there are so many in here. I thought Matthew McConaughey's was really good because he told a story of having trouble starting the lawnmower. Yeah. And he said, dad, I can't do it. And his father said, no, son, you're just having trouble. So throughout his life, when he faced obstacles or couldn't do something, he would say, I'm just having trouble. In other words, that whatever challenges you face, they can, they can be surpassed. Um, I mean, just Hugh Jackman, who is, by the way, can I just say, Hugh Jackman is bar none the nicest person on the mm. planet. He is such a generous, nice, talented guy. He wrote uh, a whole thing about trusting your gut. Mark Shaman, who is an incredibly talented composer, talked about being prepared to play for Bette Midler when she suddenly needed a pianist when I guess somebody called in sick. And, you know, I mean, there, Jimmy Carter, Larry King, Tavis Smiley, um, Michelle Kwan, one of the inmates that I just described, talked about how meaningful her essay was. And it was about the importance of falling down. As a, as a yeah. champion figure skater, she spoke about those things. Jimmy Kimmel, wrote kind of a crazy one that was, when in doubt, order the hamburger, which is what his dad used to always say. You know, they're really fun. Some are on mentors, some are on, um, you know, rejection and resilience and how to deal with that. Some are on doing what's right. Bob Schieffer wrote uh, one on Mamo's rule, rules, which that was his mom. And, you know, very basic rules that he lives by today, like don't lie, cheat, or steal. When you go out, always comb your hair and get your shoes shined and things like that. But they're all, they're really actually fun to read. 
Uh, Madeleine Albright wrote about never play hide and seek with the truth. And uh, she made up these lies when she was little about winning all these competitions. And then she got caught by her parents and then made up all these lies about her, the, being mistreated at school. And just one lie snowballed into another and she was severely punished. And she talked about just the, the importance of being honest. And Eric Stone Street, I don't know if you guys watch Modern Family, but um, he's on Modern Family. He wrote a poem about, uh, sort of just about how to live your life. And one of my favorite lines is, remember the old lady taking forever at the grocery store is somebody, somebody's grandma, which I think about now whenever I get frustrated if an elderly person's driving slowly in front of me or things like that. So there's just, there's just fantastic, uh, I think, essays throughout the book that, that, can, that are really inspiring. Yeah, a couple of the themes I picked up were, um, and that I, I felt was somewhat related to your own life, was uh, a number of the people said, look, no matter what, be yourself. And the second was, be willing to take risks. And it seems like that's some of the hallmark of your career, too, as you've moved, to, you know, you've moved through the news world. Yeah, I don't seem to be able to keep a job. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think that change is exciting and energizing and, uh, you know, a few people were very nice when I was autographing books and said that they miss me on the Today Show. And I miss the Today Show as well because, as my mom said on my last day, you know, this is the perfect job for you because I like doing some serious interviews, but I also like to have fun and laugh and smile and, and carry on occasionally. So, um, but, but I really wanted to take this opportunity at CBS for all the reasons you described, John. You know, there hadn't been a female solo anchor on the evening news and the history of the evening news. And, uh, you know, I think especially as, as someone who has two daughters, especially someone who came of age in the feminist movement and believes strongly in equality between men and women and equal opportunity, I thought when I was presented with that chance, I needed to take it. And I'm really glad I did. I always thought, you know, there's an expression, if you can't see, you can't be. And I thought the image of a woman doing that job competently and confidently was a really important one. And if I had an opportunity to do that, I wanted to embrace it. So, and I really am very proud of the work I did. It was tough at first because I think, as I said recently, if you're a trailblazer, you sometimes get burned. And uh, there was a lot of criticism early on, uh, everything from my makeup to my winter white blazer, which was winter white, by the way. It was Armani, and it was, even though it was after Labor Day, it was perfectly acceptable. I just want to set the record straight. <laughs> it made me so mad. <laughs> and, you know, the way I held my hands and all that. But it was very character building, to be honest with you, because I've always been pretty thin skinned. And I think when you're a public figure, you know, you get, especially now with the internet, uh, you know, don't go to the comment section, by the way, <laughs> if there's an article about you. It is just like so masochistic. And uh, <laughs> I stopped doing that. I stopped Googling myself a long time ago. <laughs> and, uh, but I'm, I'm really proud of my five years there. I'm proud of the work I did. Um, and, you know, I, ulti I initially went there to kind of change the, the evening news to make it a little less formulaic and a little less predictable. But I think ultimately the audience may not have wanted that. So we went back to a quite a traditional format. Um, and I think we did a really good job with that. And I'm proud of the work I did. But after five years, um, you know, keeping with the theme of being true to yourself, I just didn't think it showcased what skills I brought to bear. And I, I like talking to people, like, I like interacting with people, and um, I like being spontaneous and natural, and that format just really doesn't allow for much of that. Right, right. You, you talked, um, you, you just mentioned about character building, and I thought it was a marvelous story towards the front of the book where you talked about how you got your first job and kind of the stick to it about it. it uh, could, you, could you relate that for us? Sure, sure. Well, um, I really wanted to go into journalism. My dad, is, uh, as I mentioned, was a print journalist and kind of steered me in that direction because the one thing I could do was write decently and I did it under deadline. In other words, I was a master procrastinator all through school. And I think knowing that, knowing that I was quite outgoing, my dad thought that journalism would be a good profession for me. And so um, I 
went to the University of Virginia and I had majored in American studies, so I had done a lot of writing. I worked on the school newspaper. But when I graduated, it was really hard to get a job, to get my foot in the door. And I had sent my resumes around and, you know, all the things that you do when you're looking for a job, but nothing was happening. So I went to the beach. I was a waitress uh, for the summer because I had always interned during the summers at radio stations. And I thought, gee, I want to have this experience just for one summer. So I came back and I said to my mom, nothing's happening, mom, for me professionally. We need to do something about it. And I asked her if she would drive me down to the ABC News Bureau in Washington, because uh, we lived in Arlington, as you mentioned. And so I got in my, our, our Buick station wagon and she drove me down. And so I said, wait here. So I got out of the car. I don't know where I got the chutzpah to do this, but I got out of the car and I said to the security guard at ABC, hi, I'd like to see Kevin Delaney. He's the deputy bureau chief. And the one man or woman looked at me like, what are you, crazy? So I said, well, can I, can I use the phone and call, call up to the newsroom? So they said, OK, because they had a house phone there. So I called up and I asked for Davey Newman, who was then the executive producer of World News Tonight. And I said, hi, Davey, you don't know me, but my name's Katie Couric, and your twin brother, Stephen Eddy, went to Yorktown High School with my sister, Kiki, and I actually <laughs> used to play, I used to play with your niece, Julie, at her house on 40, uh, off 40th Street. It was in that cul-de-sac, you know, right off Woodstock. <laughs> yes. so, you know, oh, yeah. it, from your paper route. And so uh, I said, can I come up and just introduce myself? And I think he was so flummoxed by the whole exchange. He said, oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> so I went up there and he then actually personally escorted me to Kevin Delaney's office past his very officious secretary who I had tried to interact with without to no avail. And I talked to Kevin Delaney and I told him how I got upstairs to the newsroom and he said, I admire your, your te I think he said tenacity or your, you know, I, I forget what he said, but I, he actually took my resume and put it on the top of the pile. And about two weeks later, I got a call, call from ABC offering me a job as a desk assistant, which basically meant I made coffee I changed the ribbons on the wire machines. This show how, shows how old I am. They, they didn't have computers, they had typewriters, and they had teletype machines with purple ribbons, and you'd put little white gloves on and change the ribbon. Um, but I did that, and I used to get Frank Reynolds' ham sandwiches on a fairly <laughs> regular basis, and, uh, and that's how my television career began. So yeah. I always tell people that because some of these kids graduating from college they have to, as I said in the book, have moxie. You know, they have to figure out you've got to have an angle because, you know, good candidates and smart people and ambitious and even talented people are a dime a dozen. You have to kind of set yourself apart. So I use that story oftentimes when I'm talking to young people to illustrate, you know, that you have to, you have, to have a lot of nerve. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <clears throat> well put. Uh, let's turn to, to uh, news for a minute. Um, you know, I, I tried to do the math. I thought, you know, Katie, throughout her career, you probably have reported on thousands of news stories by now. And I wondered, is there, when you have so much news coming at you in any given time, is there one or two news stories where you just went, wow? I mean, it personally affected your life or your outlook on the world because it was, you know, such a big deal. There are so many stories. Um, I've, I've covered because I've been in TV news now for 33 years. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so I've really had a front seat, you know, front row seat on history. And uh, there have been so many, but a, a, a few, I think a few for me personally stand out. Um, I think that Oklahoma City, the Oklahoma City bombing was um, so devastating and of course, a bit of a precursor to 9-11, which was the worst day, I think, in, in my experience as a journalist, and of course, one of the darkest days for this country. That was a very, very difficult and heartbreaking day, and actually heartbreaking weeks and months, because even after the confusion and chaos of what had happened had subsided, there were so many people looking for their loved ones, and it just ripped my heart out every day to see people holding those Xerox papers with their children or their fiancés or their parents. And uh, that was really, really tough, uh, that whole period of time for the country and for me personally. 
Um, you know, like everyone else, when that tower was on fire, I thought, I, I, I don't know why, I think I have a hard time wrapping my brain around terrible stories, and I always try to rationalize or, or, or think, think it's not as bad as it is. And I thought, gosh, that's awful. Some man in a private plane had a heart attack and crashed into that building, but thank goodness it's before nine o'clock because that means a lot of people won't be inside. And of course, we all know how that story unfolded. We all know all those souls who died that day. I recently did a number of pieces on the 10th anniversary and you know, people are so resilient, but it was just to have, I've had a lot of loss in my life, but to have someone perish so instantaneously in, in a matter of seconds, it's been so hard for many of those families. And I interviewed a photographer who saw a lot of people jumping out of those buildings that day. And uh, you know, it's just unspeakable, unspeakable horror. I think that's the only way you can, you can put it. But, you know, I don't know why there have been a lot of happy stories I've covered too, but I think those are the ones that are most affecting. Columbine, when those two boys just went on that rampage and I was sent there right away. And that was one of, I think, the most profoundly moving interviews I've ever done because it was an African-American dad who had lost his son, Isaiah, who was a football player, and this young white 10th, gosh, I think he must have been in 10th grade, Craig, Scott, whose sister Rachel never came out of the high school. And this had happened the day before. And for whatever reason, which has always um, puzzled me in a way that people allow themselves to share their stories on television when they're so painful and personal and tragic. I think in, in a way it validates the life lost. But for them, their emotion was so raw and it was so intense and it was an April day and it was pitch dark because it was earlier in Littleton than it was in New York and it was snowing. And these two people were just sitting next to each other, giving each other comfort and holding each other's hands and just trying to get through their stories. And it was just, I think the whole visual imagery of it their raw emotion uh, and their coming together in grief was just an almost spiritual experience for me to witness. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that, um, specifically on 9-11, I remember I was on the West Coast and I was watching the Today Show during the coverage. And it, what stunned me at the time was the, the enormity of that moment and the tragedy. But there you were with Matt and I wondered you must have some switch inside of you where you're just able to let the emotion kind of roll through you while you act as a professional news person and still tell the story. I mean, it, how do you do that? Well, I, I think that day, you know, I sometimes, they rebroadcast that morning sometimes, on, actually every year on MSNBC, and this year, in preparation for the 10th anniversary, I was home, you know, waiting to go into work that next day. I thought, gee, I'll watch this because I haven't really looked at it in a while. And I couldn't believe how calm I seemed on television yeah, yeah. Uh, because my hand was shaking like that the whole time. I remember during a commercial break running to call my mom and dad because our house in Arlington isn't that far from the Pentagon. And I think there was that one period of time where you know, the World Trade Center happened and Shanksville happened and the Pentagon happened and you just didn't know how many planes had been hijacked, what was going on. You really, I did, I don't know if people watching did, but I had a sense that the world was coming to an end in a, in a strange way. And so I, I've never felt so much responsibility in my professional life because I thought people were depending on us, on, on Matt and Al and me to give them the most accurate information, to talk to the people on the phone who were eyewitnesses at the scenes, scene. And by the way, they were pretty extraordinary too. Yeah. Some yeah. of these people who were close to the towers watching this calling happen, yeah. you know, yeah. calling in and, yeah. and keeping their wits about them when they were in much more danger than we were. So I think I do have a switch because I, first of all, I, I, I'm above all, I try to be a professional person but I also knew that 
many eyes in the country were watching and were des hor as horrified as I was telling, you know, recounting everything that was going on, they were horrified watching it on television. And um, I think that's what kicks in, this responsibility to, to give information, and ultimately, that's my job. Yeah, well, you've done many, many stories like this. Is there something you do to decompress after the moment, or, is there, or what do you do to relax to kind of get it past you? That's a good question. I don't think I relax very much. <laughs> oh, I take bubble baths. I don't know. Um, I, uh, you know, I think for me, just being with my friends, being with my daughters, and being with my family, and you know, I'm pre I'm very normal. Like I like going to movies and normal things like that. And and I'm a very gregarious, outgoing person. So I, I enjoy the company of people, and you know. I think I sort of decompress that way. I'd like to say I run marathons, but I, I don't really do that. I wish I could. <laughs> um, I try to exercise as much as I can. But, um, you know, I think if you're a journalist, you don't, you don't live for, obviously, events like 9-11. But you know that when that moment comes, you have got to be operating on all four cylinders. I remember when President Bush walked into the White House when I was doing a tour with Mrs. Bush, with Barbara Bush, and so I thought he was out of town. It was the 250th anniversary of the White House, and uh, she was showing me around the Dolly Madison tea set, and I had studied all these things, you know, the ball and cloth feet, and Mrs. Reagan, you know, all the things that were in the White House. I had to kind of learn this, and so I was totally focused on interior decorating, and President Bush came in. I heard Ranger first, and I was like, oh my God, I think that's the president. So suddenly I was facing the leader of the free world and had to ask, questions off the top of my head about Iran-Contra, huh. about the re-election campaign, and I think I just kept going. I thought I was going to end up saying, so what's your favorite meal at the White House? And, you know, <laughs> I thought it was going to run out of questions, but um, I just kept asking them, and I mean, talk about the adrenaline flowing, and Marlon Fitzwater finally came out, and I said, Marlon's pulled out what's left of his hair, because <laughs> he was getting very frustrated with me. But I think I kept the President, President Bush, uh, you know, and engaged in our conversation for about 19 minutes. Wow. So I've yeah. never had quite such an adrenaline producing experience in my life because even though 9-11, it was a different kind of adrenaline and I had the support of my colleagues and in this instance, instance, I was just sort of out there by myself. Yeah, well, speaking of fam interviewing famous people uh, and you've interviewed many, many hundreds, um, are there one or two that stand out in your mind as, as being ones that you go, wow, that was my best, or that was an incredible interview? Other than Mrs. Reagan? Other than Mrs. Reagan. <laughs> <laughs> uh, know your audience, right? <laughs> um, well, I, I did. I, I, I really loved talking to Nancy about uh, President Reagan's love letters. He was a really beautiful writer, and as somebody who appreciates beautiful writing and strives to achieve that, that was a really special experience for me. Um, you know, there have been so many. I loved Herman Woke. I know that's kind of crazy. He wrote The Cane Mutiny, but I just, he have so, had so much personality. It was so much fun to talk to. I love talking to authors because, you know, a lot of movie stars come on and, um, you know, they're just so bored <laughs> with the, whatever they're talking about. They finished the movie six months to a year ago. They have to promote it. Some of them are great, by the way. I mean, not all of them, but I, I find that authors are so invested in their, it's their baby that they've put together. So I really enjoy talking to them. I've enjoyed interviewing a lot of politicians. I never had an opportunity to interview President Reagan. Um, it may be controversial in this, this group, but I thought the interview I did with Governor Palin was impactful and was an important interview for people to understand her policy positions and where she was coming from and, and what she thought about various things because I think they did, the campaign did s such few interviews that it was an opportunity for Americans to get to know her better. Um, so I, you know, I think I interviewed Katherine Hepburn once and that was a thrill, you know, to be <laughs> sitting, and I did it at her, in her townhouse on the Upper East Side right after I'd had Ellie 
And uh, so I flew up there, I was on maternity leave, and I sat down and she said, what is your name, dear? <laughs> and I thought, that is so rude. Did, did, did they not tell Katherine Hepburn, like, who was interviewing? Not that I was all that or anything, but I just thought, you know, as a courtesy, this is who's interviewing you for what show? And I said, oh, oh, um, it, it's, it's, it's Katie Couric, Miss Hepburn. Oh, no, I said, she said, what is your name, dear? I said, it's Katie. And she goes, not your first name, your last name. What is it? It's so weird. <laughs> <laughs> so that was sort of fun. <laughs> um, but seriously, I mean, it's just been a who's who of, uh, one of my very favorite people was Audrey Hepburn because I had never met First of all, I worship Audrey Hepburn, and I, I just thought she was the most ethereal, ethereal, beautiful creature. And she was so gracious. She walked around the Today Show studio introducing herself to every technician, huh. every stage manager, every person who was there. And she later, uh, I, was, a uni I were, was doing something for UNICEF, I think, and she was too. And she, she painted me a little hand-painted card of a woman carrying a baby on her back and wrote me a lovely note. And it's one of my most cherished possessions. And, you know, you asked about kind of having that professional mode kicked it, kick in. When Audrey Hepburn died, uh, ironically, of colon cancer, when I think she was only about 64, I, I could not compose myself. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the obituary, I had to say to Brian Gumbel at the time, I think I'm gonna need you to throw to the commercial because I was just so, so distraught by her death. It's funny, you just never quite know how things will affect you. Yeah. Well, speaking of incredible tragedy, no one can know who Katie Kirk is without knowing about your wonderful husband, Jay, and that uh, you lost him at the ridiculous young age of 41 to colon cancer. And I know that you've spent a great part of your life since then um, raising tens, in fact, hundreds of millions of dollars for cancer research. And I wondered, is there a message, you know, what have you learned through this process, Katie, and is there a message out there you have for everyone in this audience or anyone watching about uh, their responsibility to be tested and to stay on top of that? Oh, well, definitely. We'll talk about screening um, for sure because I'm sort of like the nagging fishwife when it comes to <laughs> colonoscopies. But, you know, that was obviously one of the most life-changing events that I've experienced personally. You know, uh, I, I, I was living this sort of charmed life. Jay used to say, I think I wrote in the book that I was born on a sunny day. You know, I'm sort of ridiculously upbeat and a very optimistic, positive person. And I had this great job at the Today Show, something I never in a million years imagined I would get. You know, I was just sort of considered a scrappy street reporter and never very glamorous. Barbara Walters always says, we're so similar. You and I aren't very glamorous. <laughs> I'm always like, thanks. <laughs> um, but, but uh, yeah, I know, is that weird? I'm like, will you stop saying that? But um, so, so things were so great and I had two beautiful, healthy daughters and, and uh, Ellie, who was five at the time, and Carrie, who was one. And suddenly, out of the blue, Jay was at 41, diagnosed with colon cancer, and it was stage four, and it was the bleakest diagnosis. It was all over his liver. It eventually went to his lungs. It actually went to his brain. And you can only imagine how harrowing that was and what a nightmare it was. I would spend every waking hour doing research, calling pharmaceutical companies and uh, universities. I remember calling some biotech firm in Tel Aviv about, you know, they were working on some kind of drug, but, you know, it, there's very little hope. There can be, by the way, because I, ha I hate saying that. And people there, I do know people who were diagnosed with metastatic colon cancer who are still alive and doing well. But at the time, it was, it was a very, very bleak diagnosis. So for nine months, I was working on the Today Show. And that was kind of this two-hour respite for me from the just having to think about Jay and think about him dying. 
every single day. I described it as like having a vice around my heart, 24-7. Mm. And uh, so ultimately, um, you know, he passed away after nine months and, you know, we never gave up hope. Someone asked me recently because I'm, I, they did an, they're doing an article in Prevention Magazine for March, which is Colorectal Cancer Awareness Month, you know, if, if I ever gave up hope. And I think, I don't know if any of you all have dealt with somebody who's very sick, but I think giving up hope sort of acknowledges the inevitable. But now I sometimes wish that I had talked to Jay more about dying because I couldn't bring myself to, deal, to do that, and I didn't want him to ever think he was. But I wonder now if that's really the fair thing to do for someone. And uh, so I have some regrets in that department. I remember saying to him, we had a house in the country in Millbrook, New York, and I said, how am I ever gonna, and he was such, he was a Civil War buff, and he was a Civil War reenactor, which at the time I thought was really super weird. <laughs> <laughs> but then I kind of, really grew to appreciate his passion for history. And he'd always say, hey, I could be out gambling or drinking or chasing women. I was like, yeah, do another reenactment. <laughs> <laughs> but I always said to him, if you think I'm gonna follow you around in a hoop skirt and a snood, <laughs> it's like whole families do it. It is really crazy. But anyway, I said to him, we had this house in Millbrook and I said, how am I gonna be able to come here? Cause he, it was a, a 1860 Greek revival and he just loved that house so much. And he loved antiques and he was such an interesting, smart person. And uh, he said, well, I hope it'll always be full of happy memories. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's about as close as we got to talking about the fact that he may not make it. But anyway, after, after he died, I just felt such a responsibility to educate the public. You know, there was actually, President Reagan had a polyp, and for a period of time, that kind of raised consciousness for, for a while. I remember, because I was, I think, at CNN at the time. But I don't think, if I was, so, I was so ignorant about colon cancer, I didn't realize it was the number two cancer killer of men and women. It's so prevalent. And I didn't realize that there's a screening technique that can really stop it in its tracks before it becomes cancerous, before it penetrates the colon wall, and before it becomes systemic disease and can metastasize to other organs. So I said to Jeff Zucker, who ironically in his 30s had also had colon cancer, I said, can I do a colonoscopy on television? And most people would have said, what, are you crazy? But because of Jeff's experiences, and we were very close friends, he said, yeah, I think you should. And that's really how my efforts to inform the public started. You know, um, I certainly didn't do it for ratings, but I wanted to <laughs> demystify and destigmatize the procedure because a lot of people couldn't even, they didn't know what a colonoscopy was. They couldn't say the, even the word colonoscopy. So. I, I think it's definitely been my most gratifying work. And I know the University of Michigan uh, did a study and they found that uh, colonoscopies increased 20% after my on-air colonoscopy, which wasn't live, by the way. Some people say hmm. it was a live colonoscopy. I'm not that gutsy. But um, <clears throat> you know, a, a lot of people, I think, started talking to their doctors about getting screened. People started sending me x-rays of their colon and telling me about their <laughs> <laughs> and telling me about their hemorrhoids. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, thank you. Nice to meet you too. <laughs> but that's okay. Actually, I'm really glad because there's no reason. You know, everybody, most everybody has a colon. And we got it. We have to keep colons healthy too. So after that, I, I started the National Colorectal Cancer Research Alliance under the um, umbrella of the Entertainment Industry Foundation, which is the ph philanthropic arm of Hollywood that does a lot of cause marketing. And we started giving block grants to various colon, colon cancer researchers from Johns Hopkins or MD Anderson, UCLA. And then I decided I was being a little too greedy about the colons. I thought, you know, I've, there's so many different kinds of cancers and there's no reason to be competitive. And I, I thought, let's do something that's going to, going to raise awareness and raise research dollars for all cancers. So a bunch of women who are very frustrated with the pace of 
of scientific progress, started this um, organization called Stand Up to Cancer. And we've done two big television shows with a lot of people from the Hollywood community. And, uh, and it's raised, uh, they've, they've raised so far $180 million. Mm. And so, yeah. <laughs> But, but, but even more than the money, what is really exciting about Stand Up to Cancer, John, is that it goes to these scientific dream teams. We've sort of tried to change the paradigm of scientific research. You know, like anything, cancer research can be political and people can be proprietary about, um, you know, what they've done and, and sharing their information and everybody wants to take credit at times. But our mandate is you have to be on a scientific dream team. So we may have scientists from MD Anderson joining forces with scientists from Harvard and Johns Hopkins and a biotech firm, and they're all pooling their wisdom, experience, and research dollars to come up with better approaches to attack this just terrible disease. You know, progress has been made, but we need to make more progress. And, you know, at first they were very uncomfortable with the notion of kind of working together. And, so, and then they, they were so excited, the scientists, they were so jazzed about it. And I think one of the other exciting things in cancer research is it's now not all focused on the primary site of the cancer. Now I think researchers are finding that that uh, an approach that may work in a childhood brain tumor can be very efficacious in melanoma. So they're trying to understand how cancer works more, how it operates, you know, proteins it may secrete, or you know, how it how it lives off the blood supply. You know, there's a whole class of cancer drugs called anti-angiogenesis drugs, which cut off the tumor's blood supply, very much like if you cut a grape off a stem, it shrivels up and dies, so that the tumor basically goes through something called apoptosis, I think it is. Probably doctors in the crowd, I probably got it wrong. But anyway, it's so exciting. And we're really hoping, and we're really seeing some great results already with lung cancer. They're studying epigenetics, which are the sort of the signals that the genes or the DNA is sent from kind of an outer shell. Anyway, I've learned a lot, and I'm just very proud of my work with cancer research because, I mean, it's not very often you can say you help save a life. And for me to be able to, to do that or to be one of the reasons people may get screened, and you know, behind that 20% statistic, there are a lot of people who are alive and well and living, you know, they're there for their kids, like my husband couldn't be, or for their, hus their wives or for their siblings. And so I'm just extremely proud of that. Yeah, you should be, Katie. Great work. Thank <clears> you. <throat> I'm getting a little emotional tonight. I'm sorry. <laughs> I think it, maybe I'm just, I don't know. I feel very emotional actually being here with, with Mrs. Reagan and with all of you. So sorry if I'm getting a little verklempt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have one last question for you, and then we'll throw it out to the audience for a couple of questions. Uh, your new show, Katie. Um, How original, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I know it's going to have a, it's already has enough affiliates signed up. That yeah, this by is the way, it's 84% of the country. 84, Mr. okay, okay. <laughs> Not 60. <laughs> and by the time we get to next September, it'll be 100%. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully. Um, uh, should this be compared to Oprah in terms of the day, the time of the day, and the format? I mean, is, do, you, do you invite those comparisons, or are you like, no, nah, look, I'm Katie? You know? Well, I have, <laughs> I have a lot of respect and admiration for Oprah. I mean, I think she had an amazing impact. And I think, you know, I was thinking about it the other day. When you're at home watching, you know, and you may be doing things around the house, or you've DVR'd it, and you're watching, and I don't think people realize how hard it is to do that day in and day out and come up with compelling subjects and compelling guests and do it in an interesting way. I have nothing but profound respect for Oprah. Um, you know, and if, gee, if I could be one-tenth as successful as <laughs> Oprah was, I'll be very happy. But, you know, I am a different person than she is. I have different interests, uh, probably different sensibilities. Um, I'm a parent, she's not, and I'm very interested in parenting issues. So I think it will hopefully have um, 
the, the, the sort of elegance, I hope, and a little bit of the, the elevated tone that Oprah had. You know, she didn't stoop to the lowest common denominator like some daytime television shows sort of have to for ratings. And you know, at this point in my career, I, I, if, if I have to do that, I just won't do the show. Yeah. So I hope it will be an intelligent conversation about all sorts of different things. Um, you know, we'll obviously have big guests on. We'll talk to some celebrities, but not just if they're promoting, promoting their latest movie. It will be about them and, and things that are interesting about them. And, you know, I find celebrities are so much more multidimensional than I think people give them credit for. And many of them are very interesting. Some of them aren't, <laughs> but <laughs> many of them are. And, uh, you know, I just am chock-a-block every day full of ideas of stories I, and subjects I want to tackle. I want to know more about how this, you know, constant, techno you know, sort of technology that our kids are obsessed with and kind of involved with. And my daughter, you know, who's 15, is just consumed by Facebook and to the point where Ellie taught her how to do a thing that will not allow you to go on Facebook for five hours and you can't reverse it because um, <laughs> Ellie's in college and she's not as into Facebook as I think Carrie is. But, um, you know, I'd like to know what is that doing to us as a society? How is it affecting developing brains? How is it affecting our social skills? There's a wonderful guy who's a law professor at Stanford named Jim Steyer, who is the head of Common Sense Media. You know, to me, I want to know about the academic studies. I, I want to know how can we help our kids navigate this increasingly technological environment, they're, uh, you know, in which they're growing up. So that's just one topic. I mean. I, I want to talk about the pressure on girls and body image. Uh, I just took part in a documentary called Misrepresentation about how women are conveyed in popular culture. And it was so interesting. I mean, I want to talk about the Navy SEALs if they do something incredibly heroic like they did when Osama bin Laden was killed. Um, I just feel like I hope people are hungry for a place. I, I don't know about you all, but I just feel like I'm inundated with information and I feel like it's TMI on a daily basis. There's so much out there. I want someone to be able to, you know, take me through it and, and talk about things and talk to experts about medicine or cancer or healthy living or, you know, there's just so, I mean, so many topics to discuss. Education in our country and what can we do to improve the state of education and you know, how can we remain globally competitive but not completely stress out our kids? What about parenting and this whole cult of self-esteem? I narrated a pan I moderated a panel on Saturday night with Bob Woodward, Rick Riley of Sports Illustrated, Spike Lee, Daniel Balud, and Glenda Bailey of Harper's Bazaar. How about that for a strange mm. group of people? But they were great. And Rick Riley said, kids can't even play tag anymore because being it is bad for their self-esteem, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was so funny. But I do think there's something there about over-parenting and living vicariously and being overly invested in your kids. And how can you have the right balance of caring and trying to nurture them and guide them without being, you know, living through them and letting them make mistakes. You know, I talked to Wendy Mogul who wrote Blessings of a Skin Knee and I talked to her about my 15 year old daughter who's just really been terrible to me lately. <laughs> and, you know, and it's affecting my self esteem a little. She's gotten a little better, but they say 15 year old teenage, teenage girls are the worst people on the planet. <laughs> and, I, I, and she said, when you were growing up, were your parents so invested in you? I said, no, I would, you know, I would do my thing and my parents would. You know, if I was kissing a boy in the basement, my dad would say, hey, what's going on down there? But they weren't on top of me all the time. They weren't kind of living and dying by every mood swing like I sometimes do. So, you know, I'd like to talk about issues like that. I'd like to talk about marriage. I'd like to talk about race. Um, I just think there's so many interesting topics and I'm still so curious about things. And, and I still feel like I have a lot to learn as a person, as a mother, as a, you know, a caring uh, daughter, you know, I'm dealing with my aging mom, which is really hard and challenging. And when my dad was sick, that was really challenging. Um, and I was learning all the time about 
things that you need to take care of with your parents. So I'm just very excited about kind of attacking all sorts of subjects. And I'm excited to have fun. This nice lady in line buying the books said, I hope you're going to have a job where you're allowed to smile again. And um, I'm happy to report I am going to smile in my new job. <laughs> um, and I think it's going to lend itself to, I mean, I think it's going to be more like this, where, but I'm, like, I'm going to do less talking. <laughs> but, you know, and the person will be talking and the guests and the expert. But it'll just be a much more natural, casual um, environment for me to do what I think I do best, which is talking, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> great, great. Uh, we have time for a few questions from the audience. If you have one, if you could raise your hand. And then uh, if you could just ask if I could do one thing, we have microphones that will wander the aisles if you could wait till one comes to you. And uh, we'll have the question. Okay, one right over here, right here. Yeah. Hi, Ms. Couric. It's great to hear everything you had to say. I'm a huge fan. Thank and you. all of your accomplishments have been such a huge motivator for women, me in particular. I'm a film director. And I loved misrepresentation. Thank you. I, I mean, I had it. nothing to do with it. I was just in it. But they no, did a good job, right? <laughs> they did a great job. And I wanted to ask you about that, because one of the things they talk about in misrepresentation is the fact that less than 3% of film directors are women. And I feel like Hollywood is, you know, we shape so much of what people perceive about role models and things like that. And obviously, there was a time when in news, women didn't have a lot of, there weren't a lot of women on television in the positions that you and Barbara Walters and other women have been in. And I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit because it seems like as filmmakers, we're behind that industry, the broadcast industry, there's still so few women. And obviously you broke through a lot of barriers and you talked a little bit about that in the documentary and I'm just curious as to, as a woman who deals with a lot of bias that I think people don't even know they have, how do you deal with breaking through that bias and getting the job? Well, I always say that I started in television news when harass was two words instead of one. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, I, I think I, I, I noticed what they said in misrepresentation about the film industry, and I don't know if you listen to what some of the male directors said, that they sometimes don't think about hiring a woman. And the woman who did the first Twilight, I think, said she did that, and then she wasn't offered any other jobs. And I think you just have to keep on fighting, because I think once women get in leadership positions, hopefully, although my dad used to say sometimes women were their own worst enemies, which, which made me upset, and Madeleine Albright has said that there's a special place in hell for women don't, who don't help each other. But, um, <laughs> you know, I think that I actually moderated a panel at the UN with women leaders from all over the world. And the president of Brazil was saying when she became president, she then put a lot of women in leadership positions in the parliament, in certain, you know, big capacities in government. So I guess that it's really important once women get in some of these roles, they help provide, provide opportunities for those women who come after them. And I, I think for me, you know, I, I think I had a lot of people say weird things to me when I was starting out um, in television. And uh, I remember I was at CNN and I was a producer for a two hour show called From Noon to Two called Take Two. And I went to an editorial meeting. And I was the only woman who walked in the room. And I was late, of course. And the man in charge, uh, the vice president of CNN, said, I don't know what they were discussing. But he said, that's not why Katie's successful. She's successful for her hard work, her intelligence, and her breast size. And this was something like in front of all these executives at CNN. And it was so appalling. And that was back in 1980. And I think, obviously, things have really changed since then. And people especially, I wrote him a scathing letter. And I don't know, again, where I got the nerve to do that. But I told him how grossly inappropriate his comment was. I was livid. And my boss, who was the anchor, a guy named Don Farmer, who was a terrific man, uh, was livid too. And we actually wrote this letter together and I sent it off to him and he sent me a very apologetic reply. But, um, you know, I just think that, that you have to keep on keeping on. I, I do bemoan the fact that 
I feel like we're sort of retro on television. Um, I think we talked about it in the documentary that I think newscasters look like they're going out clubbing instead of delivering the news half the time, especially in L.A. Hello. <laughs> I don't know how you guys deal with that. It's shocking to me. And, you know, it's sort of strange because I feel like, gosh, we've worked so hard to have a seat at the table, and now you're going to dress like a total sleaze. And it's so frustrating to me when women do that. But I st still think women are confused. You know, they want to be respected for their intelligence, but they also want to be considered hot. So it's very, I think, confusing for people. And I think I said that in the documentary. Uh, right over here. Hi. Hi. This is my good friend who goes to USC who wants to be a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> book the best advice that you ever got so what do you think the best advice that you could ever give would be to an aspiring journalist who loves what you do and uh, wants to do what you do one day well you know television um, television news has changed a lot since I entered the field in 1979 um, obviously with the advent of the internet the way people consume information has changed radically so my advice to you would be to get a great education, learn about a lot of things, learn about economics, which I wish I had studied more, to be honest with you, um, learn about international relations, learn about history, I think, because I think history, knowing about the past helps you understand the present. And uh, so, so learn the basic skills of journalism, how to be a good writer, how to write well, how to, do an interview, you know, avoid those yes or no answers. <laughs> so don't ask questions that can be answered in a yes or no. Um, and, and just become very skilled in, in sort of the, the craft itself. But then I would definitely work in a place that has a strong digital uh, component because I think that we're sort of seeing the transition. And there are always, I think there will always be an appetite for good content but I think you really want to keep an eye on how much, the tech, how much technology has changed the field of journalism and, and adapt to that technology. We've got time for one last question, and we'll go back here. Hi, Katie. Hi. I'm a big fan. I, follow you. I miss you on the Today Show. I uh -huh. wish you would go back there. But anyway, <laughs> uh, I know that someday you will hang up your boots. I'm just wondering, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? Oh, gee. <laughs> I already told you what I was going to put on my gravestone. <laughs> I mean, I think what I said to John earlier, I think the work I've done with cancer advocacy, um, I hope that's, that's what I'm, I'm remembered for the most. But I also hope that I'm remembered as somebody who, you know, gave it her all. Uh, most of the time, and really, you know, I have, I, I think I have a pure desire to help people, as I learn and try to understand the world around me, to help other people understand it, and to give them information that can improve their lives in a myriad of ways. So I hope I'll be remember, remembered as being a, a good person and um, a strong advocate for patients who have cancer, families, who are dealing with cancer and a, a big cheerleader for the people who I truly believe are the unsung heroes and heroines of our country. And those are those scientists who work day in and day out with very little recognition and not enough pay and not enough money to do the work they do. Well done. Katie, thank you. <clears throat> We cannot thank you enough for coming, Katie. It's just been terrific to have you here, and we wish you the best of luck with your new show. Thank okay. you. Thanks, thank you John. So thank you all.